All right, welcome uh, to this month's episode of Exposure, November. Uh, yeah, like Peter said, we were considering doing the Breakfast Club, and maybe that one will get put on the table for uh, the future. But I also really, I, I hadn't seen this movie. It was on my list before Peter recommended it. And yeah, I loved it. I, I was expecting it to be a thing that I just sort of, so like, yeah, I, I see why we want to do this. There's some some ideas in here that we could dig into, but I just found myself just really immersed in it and just really, really loved it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation, not only to hear what Peter has to say, but what all you have to say. So uh, yeah, welcome. I see there's a few people here that I maybe don't remember from past exposures, but uh, yeah, this will be a great talk. I'm going to hand it right back to Peter. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, this has been great by way. Exposure has been a real um, a beautiful addition to what has been going on in this uh, ecosystem. So Justin, I really appreciate that you've been been doing this um, and I definitely want to be more a part of it. So uh, I selfishly, as I said, it's a good chance for me to, to watch good movies and talk about them. So what I'm going to do is, you know, I don't want to take too much time, but I'll do maybe chat for 15 or 20 minutes um, about the movie and, and the way I look at it and then, you know, open it up for 40 minutes of discussion. Um, the, the plot outline in brief um, is that, you know, I, I'm obviously going to miss out a lot, but I'm going to try and strip it down. And you've got really two men who have um, uh, suffered a loss of their one, uh, their wife uh, committed suicide, but she's still alive. So it's all about presence of absence, right? So the, there's about people who are dead and gone, but not gone, but remain present. So for one of these men, um, the, the wife is in a coma. So between life and death, kind of not even between life and death. Like that's the thing. It's, it's not a in between. It's like you're both not there and there. And then for the other, um, I don't know if it says um, how she died, but you know, the other, this, this woman died. There are other losses. So the, there is uh, Amir who, uh, you know, the woman who committed suicide is uh, his mother. And then there's also a restaurateur who, is that, is that the right term for it? Owner of a restaurant who, um, uh, who's mourning the loss or he hasn't mourned the loss of a dream of setting up, I think it was a British pub, right? So there's, there's various elements, but we'll concentrate on the two, uh, these two figures. Um, you can then read it as a movie that is about the loss of another. It's a movie about mourning. It's a movie about um, the inability to mourn. And the other could, you know, if you want to take a psychoanalytic view, you could maybe say it is the mother other. Um, it's the kind of, a, you know, there's a certain eatable dimension to this. And it's interesting that there is two men and the woman who's lost the mother, the losing of the mother, that kind of thing. So um, for Claude Levi-Strauss, and I mentioned that I was going to, um, in the, I think when I was talking about this earlier in the week, that I wanted to use Claude Levi-Strauss as a kind of lens through which to look at this film. I think um, he's, he's incredible uh, anthropologist and his work on myth is second to none. And uh, Levi Strauss talks about how in stories and myths, there's, there's a problem, there's an issue. Um, and so I wanna kind of name the issue in pig as the issue of how to deal with the trauma of the loss of the other. And you have kind of two different solutions, initial false solutions to this problem. Uh, the first, is one guy, the chef, go, becomes a recluse, goes into um, a kind of rural environment and basically gives up on desire, basically, you know, give, gives up desire. And then the other is someone who is urban, who gives himself over, as a bit of calling the businessman, uh, Darius, who wants to be, uh, to accomplish within capitalism, you know, success and money and whatever. So these are two responses to an avoidance of this trauma, to not mourn. Um, and the object that, that holds these two together is the pig. And the pig is a type of fetish object. So a fetish object is an object that it's not magical, but we treat it as if it is. So we know it's not magical. We know it's just a pig, but somehow it has a magical function. So the magical function of the pig for the chef, Robin, is... Um, is that while he has the pig, he doesn't shed a tear. 
right? It, 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 event, it prevents him from feeling the full emotional trauma of the loss that he's had. Just like I have know a family, whenever their son died, they kept the bedroom just as it was. And it was only when they you know, took apart the bedroom years later that the, the father, who's a very stoic individual, was able to you know, have an incredible emotional outburst. And we probably had elements of that, but there was a certain sense in which there was a fetish object. Or if you break up with somebody, and maybe you have the dog and the dog is there. And then weirdly, when the dog dies, you have this incredible emotional outpouring over the death of the dog, more so than you would usually have, because the dog was a type of fetish object that prevented you from experiencing the full power of the trauma. So this pig is acting as this or transitional object, maybe uh, when I call it, we call it fetish object. Um, and I guess also for Darius, the businessman, it's a type of fetish object that's part of like he wants this pig that will get him these great truffles that will make more money, et cetera, et cetera. So this pig kind of joins the two characters together. Um, now, what's interesting about this is Levi Strauss talks about this as like myths and stories. They have a contradiction. They have an issue. They have a problem. We have this problem of how to cope with the death of the other, the loss of the other. And we have two kind of solutions to that don't really work. Then Levi Strauss says that a good a, a, a myth then has a twist. It tries to solve this problem, and the first attempt to solve is always a failure. And his first twist. Um, now, when Levi Strauss talks about this, he doesn't say all myths have this structure. Um, in that some myths haven't got to completion yet. <laughs> but when, but by the time a myth gets to completion, it will have all of these elements. So there is a universal dimension to this, but it's like Hollywood, most Hollywood movies don't get to the end. They're the perpetuation of the field, um, the field uh, solution. Um, but when you watch movies, like, like something like Rocky, we were watching Rocky four last night and, um, the director's cuts, there's an ultimate director's cut by Sylvester Stallone. And um, it's very different. They took 40 minutes out and they put 42 new minutes in, made a new different kind of almost a different movie. Um, but going like, well, in Rocky, over the course of the films, I think you could do an analysis that all of these elements that we're going to talk about are in the movies. Um, but when a myth comes to maturity, it gets to, you know, what we're going to talk about, the double twist. But the first solution uh, and this is why I think Pig's a very good movie, is it plays with the idea that you think it's going to be like a John Wick film, right? Now, whether that was intentional or not, um, uh, uh, I know some people who, who don't think it was, but I, th I think it was, but is you've got, jo uh, you've got Nicolas Cage, you're thinking this guy is going to go into the city, cause some havoc, and the solution is going to be revenge, right? Justice and revenge, that's the solution, right? That, that we think is gonna happen. And this is very, Levi Strauss talks about the first twist. And this is where it kind of gets a wee bit complicated, but not that complicated is when the two characters kind of switch positions. So that's the first twist. So the interesting, when you watch Pig, the recluse who's given up desire Who's, who's living basically in a melancholic existence in, in the forest, kind of then takes on the, uh, the role of the businessman who then now is like actually pursuing something, going into the city, right? From the rural to the urban, going into the re-engaging in this environment to find this pig. And so we have this interesting twist and this possible solution to, to the problem of mourning, the problem of the loss of the other. But the thing about Pig is it continually subverts it. So just some of my favorite bits. <laughs> I mean, the first bit where he finds out where the two drug addicts are who stole the pig. And I, it was a while since I watched it, but from what I remember, right, he goes to this market or whatever. He gets this information about where these drug addicts are who stole his pig. And then he marches over. And I'm fully expecting him to walk in and kick some ass, beat these guys up, like force them to say where the pig is. And it's going to be this, this justice retribution narrative that starts with beating up. And I think basically the next clip is when they're inside the caravan, all like drinking coffee or drinking tea. And, and he's like talking about how pissed off he is that they stole his pig. And they're like, yeah, really sorry. We really shouldn't have done that. And, then, and it, it completely subverts this kind of like expectation of he's going to like 
solve the problem through violence. And, you know, he then, the, through powerlessness, that's the interesting thing. So not the power, it's not the power of force, but through powerlessness, like, listen, this has really hurt me. Why did you do it? Da, da, da. He gets the first clue uh, to go into the city and, and where to find the pig. And then, of course, in this next scene, which again is brilliant, where it's like an underground fight club. And again, you're going and you're going, okay, right now he's going to kick some ass, right? There's this fight, underground fight club where all the, the chefs and the people who work in the kitchens get together and have these fights. And like, correct me if I'm wrong, but what, it's, what, what I remember is, right, the whole point of the fight club is that the bosses, the, the head chefs, would allow the workers to beat the living hell out of them, right? Um, and it was partly connected to how long they could last and people would bet. And so, of course, Nicolas Cage stands there as this in incredibly important, the best chef in the city at one stage and lets this guy beat him to a pulp. And this elicits a response. This powerlessness elicits the next uh, uh, hint to where how to find the, the next clue to how to find the pig. And then we get, you know, in, in this restaurant again, where Nicolas Cage doesn't force information out of the person who owns the restaurant, but reminds him of his loss that he hasn't mourned. That he says, like, you want, you always wanted to have this, this English pub, you always wanted it, but now you've, you've sold out, you've lost that vision. He helps this man mourn the loss of that dream and to rekindle that. Um, and that elicits the next clue. So we've got all these clues, all these powerless discourses that kind of keep subverting what you expect. And what happens is the, for the two men, Robin and Dar uh, is it Darius, uh, the, the way that they eventually confront the suffering of the loss of the other is one through a meal, and I love that thing where he gives this list of kind of like, here's some stuff you have to get. And again, it connotes Terminator. It connotes, you know, these are, you know, get these weapons, get these tools of destruction. This is what we're going to do. And then, of course, you discover that it's like a some, uh, you know, from a bakery, a, a freshly baked roll and this fine wine. Um, so you have uh, you have this experience. Um, uh, and that's what breaks the businessman, who, by the way, I should have said, both of them have been broken from social relation. Like both of them in different ways are completely outside of uh, community, outside of social relation. One has withdrawn himself and doesn't really see anybody, bar Imar, who goes there once a month or whatever to pick up truffles. And the other guy who will just kind of walk over anybody to get what he wants and doesn't have anybody in his home and lives in this very, is, and is estranged even from his son, right? So these are two people who have completely, they're outside of the this, this social system, really. Uh, the, the man whose wife committed suicide uh, and is in a coma or attempted suicide, uh, he encounters his grief through the cooking of this meal. And Robin encounters his grief through the death of the pig, through learning that the pig has died, he loses his fetish object. And then now is fully confronted with his own suffering and his own grief. This can be called the double twist in, in Levi Strauss. So the second twist is where the trauma is not externalized and and, and worked with, but now becomes part of the characters themselves. So now they experience themselves as divided subjects. They experience the loss, they experience the sorrow directly. And the beautiful end to the film, very subtle end, is when the guy Robin goes back to his cabin in the woods and is able to put on this tape of his wife singing I think, a Bruce Springsteen song uh, that she made for his birthday. Uh, so the idea like now he's finally able to actually listen to that song, to mourn and to remember. And there is that idea I've talked about before, but uh, in, in, in uh, cemeteries, you see the phrase gone, but not forgotten. Uh, in psychoanalysis, there is another thing, which is the forgotten, but not gone. That when you forget 
as in you put out of your mind, you, put, you don't mourn, you put it all out of you and you get on with life. What you put out, what you forget is not gone. It remains within you um, in broken social relations and various symptoms that are destructive. But when you can finally get to the um, gone but not forgotten, where literally you can remember. And so he's listening to the tape. He's recalling her. He's remembering her. Then she's gone as a poltergeist, as a symptom. And she, she's able to be integrated into his life in a better way. Now, of course, they probably neither guy changes that much. He might stay a recluse. The other guy might stay a businessman. But both of them, it, the film ends basically the possibility that they have resolved the pro they have resolved the problem at the beginning, which is how to deal with the loss of the other, not by resolving it, but by integrating it. That's the double twist where the contradiction is integrated, the trauma is integrated into the character, into the person. And that's where the film ends, because that's the true reconciliation. It's not where Hollywood ends, which is the violent retribution, the, 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 the marriage, the getting, the getting the lost object, getting rid of the trauma, getting rid of the, the antagonism that starts the film, right? That's, that's where a lot of Hollywood films stop, and that's why they're repetitive. They're absolutely just a, what can be called a repetition compulsion of the same issue. That what's so satisfying, I think, structurally or narratively of Pig is that it goes beyond that. It subverts that. And what you really get is really three or four individuals in the film all so there's even a scene where Amir goes to see his mother, you know, so he's probably the one who's the healthiest, right? He he's he's the one who's you know out of the out of all of these three individuals. Uh, the other three, you know, the guy who owns the bar, Darius and Robin. Um, but all of them have to learn how to remember their dream. Even that guy in the restaurant has to remember that he wanted to have that pub. He has to remember, recall it. He has to feel it. He has to mourn. And Freud wrote this famous essay you know, on mourning and melancholy, which is in a sense, melancholy is the inability to mourn. You become melancholic. Mel to overcome melancholy, there's a certain mourning that has to take place. Um, there's a lot more in the essay, but it's part, part about mourning and melancholy. These people have to learn to mourn. They have to learn to remember and to mourn. So, okay, that's, that's what I got from the film. That's what I enjoyed about it. Um, you want to jump in and give me your comments and thoughts? Pete, can I start? I want to accuse you of, being a, of reducing it a little, being a little bit too simplistic <laughs> with it. Um, and it's from the canonical formula perspective, uh, the Levi Strauss, he requires two functions and you outline, you outline the grief function, but the, the, there's the second one. And I, th I see it in the film. So like in the Oedipus, he has the two functions of family relations and then he, humanity's origins. So in this movie, there's the function of like, how do you, how do you deal with loss? But then there's also like the, the reputation, who are you? And Nicholas Cage is going through representing like, you are your face. Like he wears, like, there's the scene where he's talking to uh, his, the, the chef and Amir saying, tell him who you are, tell him your name. And his response to that is to look up at the chef and show his face. Or in the fight club, there's, he writes his name on the board and is he that name? But then that name, like he ends up getting his face beaten to a pulp. And it's with Darius, like the, your name comes to mean like your possessions. Are you your possessions? And Darius wants to possess his wife. Like he's not letting her die. She's become like this object to her. And uh, Name-wise, Darius means possessor. Um, while Robin, or which means fame, um, he's going through, and it's like it's it's his face that he that he's proving is still known. Like when Edgar tells him, "Like you're nobody, you don't even exist," he proves his existence by showing that his face is still recognized. Um, in addition to his name still being notable, so you have the. And interestingly, I think it's that Darius, who's representing like that name, you possess things through their name aspect, 
he's trying to keep his wife alive by maintaining her face. Um, and um, Robin, his wife, who has died and just become a name, and his the woman at the memorial home tells him, like, I've maintained a place, the spot next to you for, for Robin. Tell Robin that there's a place for his name here. But, like, there's this whole thread going through of, like, what even Amir raises it when he says, like, everything I do is about my reputation. Is And the dialogue is really, like, centered around this, that question of who are you? Are you your name or are you your face? Or however you want to state that binary. Very good. Yes. And that that is, so that's the thing that creates the double twist is you, those two binaries, the grief and the reputation get twisted together at the end. Very good. I have to think about that. That sounds good. I like it. Um, so just very briefly. So then the, you're saying the two, what, the two characters represent what then? So Darius represents the yeah it's so Darius is like you're you you're going to possess things you're going like that it, you are what you have right um it's like you're your name that you could write on documents showing the ownership of things and Robin is more on the on the lines of like it's your being it's your desire it's your being it's it's your face it's like it's more it's like it's the you only get a couple things that you get to care about it's what you care about that is who you are and he's more on like that embodied side so yeah so the, yeah i'm just thinking there, there's gabriel marcel with a great book called being and having but that's what you're kind of almost it's like, is it, so one is uh being and one is having in a sense there's a is that so darius is having and and robin is being is yeah that, yeah okay and the, yeah there's and the contradiction between those two things yeah that, and that, that, yeah and you you kind of get it through the pig as well because i it's the i started thinking it was a movie about um um commodification like the commodification of our relationships because the way that he's getting people to help him find his pig is by saying that she's like i don't have a business without her you can't rely on me i'm here unless i have the pig and so that this relationship's been fully commodified. And at the end, he, near the end, he reveals, no, I don't need the pig for my business. It's because I love her. Yeah. And like that, that love is becoming like the double twist where all of these things get tied together. Yeah. But I, I so I started out by thinking it was a movie about commodification and then look like trying to untangle that. What does it mean to have your, your reputation? Yeah. And yeah. I just see that going throughout. Very good. I know I like that. And also you reminded me, like whenever he says, um, I just love the pig, just in mm. one sense, you could say that actually the pig becomes the where he transfers his love for his wife. So it's not that he loves his pig, he loves his wife through the pig. And that's what's really interesting is that somehow the pig becomes the, the site where he is able to love mm -hmm. his wife and, and avoid the confrontation with the trauma. But yeah, no, I like what you're saying about being and having. I haven't thought about that, but that's that's very, very good. Thank you. I want to jump in. Well, that's the uh, yeah. I, I recognize so much transference, not just from Rob, but Amir and even Darius with the pig. And it's, I mean, it might be a sexist metaphor, but the idea of the pig being this second trauma or this double twist, mm. um, both in the Freudian sense of the the double uh, the dual traumatism or whatever he called it, and strauss's double twist like you have the death the dying by suicide but being on life support with amir and darius and then you have the death of rob's uh wife and then the pig becomes this kind of lost object for all of them through which they can it's the it's the double twist through which they can actually experience the trauma of that initial loss and it's uh I love the ambiguity of the pronouns throughout the film when he says, I loved her referring to the pig, mm -hmm. but also to his wife. When Darius says uh, she died referring to the pig, but also Darius's wife, Rob's wife, the pronoun, I mean, the pig becomes 
again, sexist metaphor, but the pig becomes uh, this lost object of the woman they both kind of lost. And it's this like traumatic hero's journey for both of them um, with a lot of shades of like Orpheus for me. Matt, maybe you can get over the sexist problem of woman is pig. And if you think of it as woman who can find the magical thing for you. Like the pig mm. isn't just a pig. Like, like the like, truffle. The truffle, yeah. So mm. woman as the one who can find the truffle. Like I, I don't, I, the pig was clean, ate off of his plate. Like it wasn't like represented as anything but like the the treasure finder. So I, I don't know. I didn't read it as like a women are pigs. It's like women can find the magic for you. And that's why it's so traumatic if you lose yeah. you know, your love. That's the old, yeah, the truffle is objet putia, which mm-hmm. is quite, I never thought of that, Sarah. That's very interesting because mm-hmm. that's the, that's the definition of women in um, some of Lacan, which is obviously the, the, uh, the holder of objet putia. So yeah, that's very good. I also love the fact that the pig, it's a mundane object that, that, you know, that is magical, that is kind of, which is love, you know, which is actually the, the kind of the, the, it's the incarnation of the lowest and the highest, um, in the lowest that's the kind of the christ narrative is god and the human in the kind of ugly figure of the human so yeah there's a, there's something incarnational about the pig metaphor potentially which is very good which is the highest and the lowest combine in the lowest but yeah yeah i love that and also the revelation at the end that he never needed the pig to find the troubles to begin with yes it wasn't yeah the pig wasn't yeah that function for him which i love because it's the pretense that we, we all pretend like uh, mm-hmm. women help men pretend to be men by and w- men help women you know feel feminine like it's almost like there there's we, we we all engage in a in a game so whenever he says i never needed the pig to find the truffle it's like oh yeah you know it's a, it's a game you know yeah. when someone says to me you know a woman says to me can you open this jar of pickles and I open the jar of pickles and I feel like a man you know and maybe she could open the jar of pickles but she thought oh I'll let him feel like a man <laughs> or whatever it is it's just it's, you know a pretense that that the, but that that develops the object putia object putia is precisely there a game that arises anyway that's maybe going too far but I love I love I didn't notice the the pronoun thing that's very clever because there is an ambiguity because the pig is a trans a transitional object it's a transference object yeah very good and an alternative line of thought, if anyone wants to explore it, I, I'm really interested in the Christian component of the film, and I'll shut up after this, but the idea of weakness, the idea of literally turning the other cheek in a sense when getting beat the hell up, the idea of uh, fellowship through communion, through a shared meal, um, the idea of a nonviolent uh, road to... Um, I don't know, that ultimate cross where he realizes the death of the pig, the death of his wife, death of God, maybe. I don't know. That's a different perspective. Anyone wants to explore? I'm done. I didn't get this when I watched the film last night, and I really love that you brought out like that the the first time the trauma happens it's like you almost don't register it as a trauma like you find ways to not register it as a trauma and then it's like you have to have a secondary loss and like that really is like yes to me and and it's like such a cool thing I wonder if like as media creators or um, kind of practice creators if we could think about how to incorporate that into our writing producing like thinking about this this twist or this like thing I love how the fantasy is not disavowed in any way like but it's like used and you know like you like the pig is alive the pig is alive um you know he doesn't realize that he still wants his wife to be alive and that's why he can't listen to like the final message but yeah I I really love that you articulated that as like the second the second trauma helps us have the first trauma that we have but haven't really experienced yet fully yeah that's very key actually that like in the freudian thing is like it's like 
the the second trauma we haven't subjectivized trauma and it's the it's the subjectivizing of the trauma that re-traumatizes us so there's this retroactivity yeah so there's this re, there's this double trauma so the, the big issue in the film is they haven't subjectivized their trauma their trauma is not it's objective not subjective it's objectively in the pig not subjectively in themselves and then they subjectivize the trauma and re, and so retroactively bec it becomes a trauma but yeah it's very good very good I'm curious if anybody can say something about the sun. Like I liked what I think you said, Kev, about or someone about how like you think it's a capitalist kind of um, relationship with the sun. Like, oh, just this for that. But then later you realize it's not needed. But something in this where the kid goes through a transition as well, because he's listening to the music the whole time in the car. And the music is telling him how to enjoy the music. And then at the very end, he just lays back and listens to music. I thought that was like such a beautiful moment where the, the kid is like the whole time is like just being told like, this is how to ex like enjoy this music. And there's something about um, the main character that is kind of acting as this Christ-like figure to the son as well, which I wasn't sure I... Like they have this like really wild bond at the end where, you know, he's going to continue to give him truffles and he's like going to continue to help him. So I don't know. I didn't understand that, but I love the way in which um, him coming to terms with his own stuff is helpful to other people in a way. Sarah, I thought that was kind of what I saw in that was uh, from the scene when uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember their names, but Robin Nicholas Cage, when he gives the speech to the his former employee saying, like, who are you doing this for? These people don't exist, or however, however he says it, that that's him trying to reveal the um, the lack of the big other, and that the the kid, when he realized, like, you don't need this big other to tell you what music, how, how to approve of this music for you, or to show you what is in this music to understand it, that he, he had no more investment in this idea of a big other that he needed for that and could just sit there and let the music happen to him. Um, which I, I, to me, like the, the scene everybody talks about and probably for good reason is that scene in the, in the fancy restaurant because it is just so striking how he shows up and how he like bears these marks of like disfigurement and can't be integrated back into polite society that he, come, that he came from, I thought was just so striking that he's just sitting there he could have so easily cleaned the blood off his face, but he wants to go back into this uh, this immaculate restaurant with those marks on him to kind of bear witness of this. Like, you you don't care. You you put nothing of yourself into this meal. You don't. You, you're not giving yourself the like the burden of caring enough about a thing. And I just thought that was so great. Another Christ-like motif, and then regarding the son, I think it's finally once he sees the division in his father, when his father breaks down after this meal, that the son, who is literally his profession, is following in his father's footsteps, his car his fancy car he's trying to become this cultured person just like his father, and once he sees his father just sort of defragmented and uh recognizes this division in his father he's like oh i don't have to do this i don't have to do this anymore and he then accepts his mother's death yeah that i mean the, the christ in the terms of radical theology that the the, the father acknowledging his self-division <laughs> and is is you know something we've discussed a lot they like god kind of realizing god's self-division and then the son, in, you know, seeing the father's recognition of self-division. I really like that. Very good. I think it's interesting with Amir. Well, one thing, his name, like, is he meant to be there as a mirror for the grief of Nicolas Cage and like, but is like, he's all after his um, reputation and his cho two choices that we see is his Camaro, but like a Camaro is like a gaudy like it's like it's a youth uh, it's not it's not a classic car it's just an expensive car and then he's like he's looking trying for classical music as like a, as that symbol of status and that is something that but it, like it's it's all these shortcuts that he's trying to take to get to that reputation like this 
this gaudy car and um, this music that I hate that, but I'm trying to love. Um, and I, I, what I see going on with Amir is also like Nicolas Cage or Robin stepping in as like his father figure. Cause he tells him your dad sounds terrible. Like he's not very supportive. And then he steps in and shows like what a supportive father might have done in this situation. Um, because it, like he has a father who's dealing with trauma and here's another man who's dealing with trauma, but in a very different way and try like it almost in a sense, it takes both of them in order to give him a true father figure. I love, I love that idea of a mirror, like a mirror. That's brilliant. Because, because one of the reasons why I think his father so despises his son is because his son is a mirror to his own brokenness, his own self. Like he sees his son as, as a kind of like weak and kind of like broken and whatever person because he can't face his own brokenness. So I mean, a mirror, you could yeah read it very much as it's a mirror that he doesn't want to look in. And Robin drives kind of drives that home and during the dinner scene when he says here's a wine that your son found like reminding him like that this son is connected to this memory that we're recreating for you as well mm. beautiful leah did you have something to say sorry i thought you reaching as if i i do i was i was talking to somebody else but um i do have my favorite part was robin driving around the city with a mirror in that ridiculous car I think that, that was actually my favorite part of the whole movie, regardless of their characters and kind of how the plot played out, just the visual of this extreme, like one guy who's way too fancy and one guy who's way too messy driving around a city that's intentionally portrayed as average. Um, so, and you're, I think I'm supposed to identify with the averageness of the city. And Robin goes to his old bungalow he used to live in, kind of an average house with a little average kid. And then they go to the restaurant where Derek was, you know, cooking the fancy food. And that's like an average guy who's doing, you know, his, his, his career is doing okay. And I think you're supposed to slot yourself as a way more normal person as the viewer. And then these two crazy guys at extreme ends of the spectrum are like perforating the city. And I don't know how they do this with the film, but what I love about it is you're so, I think you're supposed to come away with seeing that average is just as crazy. Average is just as disrupted. And that the, ex the extremeness of these two guys is, is an, it's an equal magnitude of whateverness should be applied to the city, should be applied to Derek, the chef with the forgotten dream, um, should be applied to that little normal bungalow. So I, I like the disruption of the averageness because the, the image of these, that guy was so messed up with his face and his hair and he just kept getting in the, that crazy car. I mean, it's, I could just watch those scenes of those two guys driving around. I'm going to, I might make a still of it. I love that. There's one of my favorite books uh, titles is a book called On Being Normal and Other Disorders by a guy, uh, Paul, I can't pronounce his surname, but it's a Lacanian book about diagnostics, but I love that title, On Being Normal and Other Disorders. <laughs> I, I had a conversation with a friend just the night before watching this film and she had been living in Portland for a few years. And she was complaining about how, because Portland has become known as a place where people are like uber recyclers and super woke, there is now this very, very image conscious feel in the city. And she said she couldn't get over how much, like how big the talk was and how little in it people were. Um, and so I thought, wow, that makes sense. I've I've never really been there, but I could see how, you know, after a place becomes a Mecca for something, people go because they've heard of it being something and it's not, it's, it's just more kind of hype than it is reality. And so that was kind of helpful for me going into the film. And, and I also really love that scene where he calls for the chef and the three of them sit down and have a conversation. Dude, that actor, I have to look up that actor because I know I remember that face, but him just like smiling super big while you can see like the death in his eyes I was like oh my gosh that is it was such a perfect image of like this is what it's like to strive and pursue under a capitalistic system you're like everything is great oh my god I love it this is what people want this is what people want and then a man with blood all over his face is like no yeah. this is not what you want <laughs> and he's like ah like just ruptured his little like worldview right there it was an amazing scene 
I love it. And I love the fact that, that, that Robin had said the only way he could describe his relationship to the pig was in was in economic terms you know it got truffles because he couldn't really say at the beginning it's just because because i love her it's because it's the transition so it's like it, it's even he puts this love of the pig in in consumerist kind of economic terms uh but he is completely outside of that the pig has no economic value to him at all um so yeah he, you know, robin really is this character that is breaking through this frenetic desire for the object yeah I really um, enjoyed it just because I actually do live in Portland uh -huh. um, and my my um, job brings me in really close contact with the Portland uh, celebrity chef culture because um, I'm a farmer and I sell my stuff, my specialty things like the truffles to the celebrity chefs. So this was just had so many layers for me that um, that were really interesting in the myth making of the celebrity chefs in town. Um, and how those myths get perpetuated, even though um, there may be nothing underlying the myth left. <laughs> um, so I really enjoyed the film, but I especially enjoyed how um, Robin disrupted every scene he was in by virtue of his appearance or um, the things he just brought, um, like especially the scene in the restaurant where he reminded that person of their dreams and what they were and what they've become and how disruptive he was just in every scene, basically. He just destabilizes and disrupted in a way that didn't let people stay where they were. It, it, um, it was almost like, I guess, a, a, a representation of the real for me, like yeah. his role there. Yes. He's, he's also, it's like he's wearing his trauma on his face rather than trying to hide it. Um, and like when he sits with the little kid and the little kid asks, does it hurt? Does your face hurt? And he says, like, yes, yes, it does. Um, it, like that it's, it's symbolic of the trauma that he's been carrying around with him. And he's perfectly willing in this at, at this point to just let other people see it, to see that he's, he's wounded. And it's not until the end when he finally washes his face off when he's come to terms with his loss and able to finally listen to his wife's voice and accept that she's gone. And I think I the only like two times someone uh, like noticed his <laughs> physical disarray was the child and then Derek the restaurateur, but only when he recognized who Rob was. Only when he knew who Rob was, he was like, are, are you okay? <laughs> Other than that, it was just the child who just has that kind of... Yeah, you get the other truffle hunter who tells him you have a little something. Uh, the first waitress, uh, who's not Marge, because Marge is dead, um, that she she says, asked, are you okay? Or when he has the blood on his head. Um, but yeah, otherwise it goes pretty much... Edgar, I don't think ever says anything especially in the city doesn't. right yeah so it's always is it always women is women or children like i don't think that um or no and then the restaurant tour then uh, derek yeah, yeah derek justin you're gonna jump in there or yeah yeah i was just i was gonna have a, a question for pete but then kind of going off of what uh karen was saying just about the celebrity chef culture and how it's just such an obsessive, like a, a disavowal of the lack and that him coming in as like, the celebrity chef par excellence, like almost like he was larger than life in that city and then intentionally bearing that lack on his face, the like letting himself just be so uh, compared to like the white coats and just the restaurant that was obsessively scrubbed, just looking so disgusting and, 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 and just flaunting it in front of these people like look look how stupid your world is like this is this is what it looks like to actually care about something or to, to actually live a life of meaning and i i think i'd like to hear from some people maybe connecting his thing about saying like you only get to care about so many things or whatever the, the quote is and connecting that to the idea of i think lack or or almost saying like you you get to like the whole point is that you get to lack something or you get to lose something you get to care about something enough that lacking that thing or losing that thing could matter to you and, and finding that as being like the source of meaning. But Pete, Pete, I 
kind of going off that, I just wanted to maybe have you unpack what you meant when he was living in in nature as that being his uh, refusing of desire or giving up of desire specifically. Yeah, like broadly speaking, I go almost like if, if you see this as a three tier thing where um, there's there's kind of the pursuit of the thing that will make you complete the city, the urban life, the the restaurateurs who want to, you know, this, they, you know, pursuing the thing. Then the nihilistic insight is the, is the, uh, is, so nihilism is where you go, oh, nothing means anything, right? You kind of like withdraw completely. Um, which is which is a step forward. So that's why I think Nicholas Cage Robin is always such a disruptive force because he is further on than these people in the city. He's had an insight, but his his arc is the third step where he has to move beyond complete melancholy and nihilism to the point of being able to find meaning in the loss itself. So that's so that's him. So there, he comes into the city and he is a prophet type. He is a messianic type in a sense disrupting our our belief in this libidinal kind of attachment to the city to consumerism but the great thing is he's not like he is it's only because he's he's experienced the the puncturing of that and i think symbolically that's what his reclusiveness is like he he's given up desire he's he's like a hermit who's forced to go into the city but then then I, for me, his, his salvation, his cure is that he's able to then now find meaning in the meaninglessness. He's able to find um, a depth. He's able to mourn. So, so, so symbolically for me, it's like he was the, the person who was melancholic, lost desire, completely living in a forest away from everybody. And, and that itself needed eventually, that's the double twist for me is the double twist is then he finds meaning in that meaninglessness through returning to the city. Does that? Uh... No, that, that, that's good. That helps me kind of understand where you're going with that. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of, while you were saying that, it made me think of maybe what I like about using him as a chef and how him figuring out how that's meaningful is that a chef, and especially the kind of chef that he's represented as, could put, put so much of himself into this act of cooking and so, like sweats and suffers and toils so much over this thing that they give away and like finding meaning in that you 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 care so much about this meal every little detail of it and then you lose it over and over again and keep repeating that act uh, as a as an identity and like that's his identity as opposed to maybe imagining this previous existence that he would have had where he would have gotten more out of just his his white coat existence and, and the identity of I'm a celebrity chef. Now he's like, I'm this grotesque, disgusting person who who puts this garnish on so perfectly and cares about every detail so that I can just give it away and never even have it for myself. And and realizing that I think is just a really amazing um, metaphor to use as the, as the chef in this. Yeah. I mean, the metaphor, I mean, it's, uh, and Matt, you, you brought that up and I didn't, I can't believe I didn't see it because it's plain as day. No, I mean, you said it's like the meal as well. Uh, the fact that they're sitting around a meal, about, like a, a communion, a shared loss, like it's it's at that point that he is able to acknowledge, uh, Darius is able to acknowledge the, the loss of his wife, which is communion is the very place where we remember the death of God, the loss of God. You know, it's communion is precisely a meal around a shared loss in which we are able to remember and mourn and laugh it is awake so yeah the the, the richness of the, of the metaphor is incredible and I, uh, i'll go ahead. i was going to say his his discussion with the little kid about the persimmon um where he's I, he's talking about grief because he says a persimmon is something that tastes uh terrible until it's ripe uh, and then there's this you have to get rid of this thing called tannins he says and then, but that grief is working the same way. And this is this is the story of the ripening of his grief, where it actually could be something that's palatable. Wow. Um, and then with that bringing in of tannins, then you're you're talking about wine as well. And then during the communion scene, um, with like this fully aged wine, 
that he already has a fond memory of from the story of Darius getting drunk with his wife. The he here is Darius. The Darius getting drunk with his wife. This is that bottle of wine, but now it's even more fully aged. Um, and so the tannins had had that time that chance um, to become even more palatable, and like how it allows his grief to come out, or Darius's grief to come out, and comes out as anger for him. But the story of the ripening of grief. Yeah, you see why the writing's so good. My goodness, I'm getting so much more from the, from this. Anybody want to jump in? And who hasn't spoken yet or hasn't said very much? But, well, I've said a lot, but I just wanted to say one more thing about the meals before we move on that. Oh, yeah. like, the son, Amir, says that his parents always went out and fought, and it was because of a meal that they came back happy. So there was also, like, why is he holding on to his wife if they mostly fought, if they mostly didn't love each other, and then it was a meal that created the fantasy of the community, the communion. So I don't know, I thought that was another, like, meal that was really fascinating. Like, like, what was it about her that then became this fantasy that he couldn't let go of? Yeah. Uh, I think what, what struck me the most throughout the film um, was to me, it was a kind of like sublime ambivalence between intimacy and distance, you know? So there's the, like the penultimate scene with Derek in the restaurant, you know? Um, where uh, like Robin's distance is represented at the beginning and the end of the scene, right? He says, I just wanna know where the pig is at. You know, This guy, this chef, this restaurant, they're just means to the end. Um, Derek could be anybody. Um, and then of course we find out that <laughs> Derek is not just anybody. Um, he remembers all the details. Um, he says, you know, it, it was the pub that you wanted to open, right? Derek, Derek had forgotten about the pub. Robin had, so Robin is fully in the singular in this point, identifying with the singular. Um, of course, the scene ends with, just tell me where the pig is at, you know? But I never felt any kind of a sense of antagonism between these two poles. It always felt like a sublimation, you know? Um, that, and, and the film strikes this note in so many areas, you know? Um, Amir is acting, again, as just a nothing, a nobody, a means to Robin's universal end. Robin is fully distant in a sense, right? But also fully intimate with him. Um, and, and, uh, and Robin's pleas, you know, for Amir to, uh, to reconnect um, with his mother. Um, for Robin, I think to be the kind of person who can remain at such a remove and live in this distance, he also has to be the kind of person who remembers the names and the faces of every patron of his business. He knows all of the ingredients, right, <laughs> for every meal. So it's like, I think of the kind of Hegelian, kind of like the sublimation of, of the singular and the universal, but this, um, but it's a play on that. Like for me, it was, it, was a, it was this intimacy and separation or distance that is so perfectly struck, this note of this non-antagonism between those two um, poles, but the, the kind of, um, uh, I guess like sublimation is the word that, that's coming to mind for me. Um, and again, to the strength of the script, it just feels like that is so powerfully <laughs> displayed um, through through the entire script. So, so I just really enjoyed that the, uh, that element. I was jealous when I watched this because I was like, I wish I'd written this. I don't feel as I, I you know, it's like it's just so good. <laughs> I wish I, I could have done it, you know. So yeah, the the, the writing is so tight. I know. <laughs> Anybody I have, else? I, I don't really, I didn't actually get to watch the movie because I saw your email about a half an hour before it started. I did purchase it and start it though. So uh, I did see the pig. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did see a little bit about their relationship, you know, in, in the, from the, well, the early scenes. So I got a sense of, you know, the feeling of the film. And, and so I'm just listening because I love, I, I often miss these and I really like, enjoy them so much. And, um, but what, so I can only bring you an experience, a personal kind of comment, how I'm personally relating to everything you're all saying, right? And what is really striking for me is I'm thinking about, um, and this probably has nothing to do with the film, so I feel really embarrassed and yet I feel compelled to share it. So, um, and is like, I grew up in the city, right? So if you live in the city, 
there's this idea that, and you have a job or you're doing exciting things or that have like meaning to other people, you feel, um, I don't know, it's, it's, like a, it's like, it's a label that you put on, right? And, but when you live on the land or you live in a rural place or like isolated like this pig, you also probably, and I, I know in this film that this is probably not the case, but there's also a, a, another community that surrounds you. And my personal experience was growing up in New York and Brooklyn and Manhattan, and then moving to the middle of nowhere. I suddenly, I was anonymous in the city. And in, this, in the country, on the land, and the people who work the land, our connections, my connection with others in my community were far deeper. And they saw me far more exposed. And I was so much more able to be so much more myself, not even realizing that at the time, but just aware that, that we were so deeply connected by our, our how, like we depended on one another in these, in, it's a rural place. It was in, in the mountains of Idaho. And, and it was striking for me. And, the, and one day I was walking with a rancher. We were at, we grazed on public land. And, and this guy, Randy Pierce, I'm like an old time cowboy guy, you know, he's been there forever. His family's been there for, you know, for a long time. And he said, um, Linda, you know why everyone gets along in this town? He says, the, the Mormons and the Christians and the, you know, because they usually fight. He, he said, we don't fight up here. We stick together no matter how different we are. And, and the sense of diversity was very striking for me because there was no racial diversity, but there was a lot of other types of diversity. And, and he said, because we have to graze together on public land and we've had to do so for generations. So we've, had, we've learned how to show up for one another. And again, this is not related to the movie. I realized this part, but, but I, it was just the, the way you were talking about the characters and their their differences and the city and uh, and being in the cabin and such and the, and the grief, uh, but it was it's just um, like when someone's daughter fell off their horse and they just moved to the country to from the city to bring up their kids in a better way and she hit her head on a rock and died you know and the grief that comes and the whole community shares in that grief where in the city that's not the case you know so um, it. it I don't know, that was just striking. And then the other thing that came to mind, which is really a silly thing, but hey, what the hell, um, is um, when you were talking about how people have different roles in opening the jar of pickles. Um, anyway, um, I, I, immediately came, I immediately thought about Bull Durham. The, it's one of my favorite films. And, um, and because it's the opening monologue that's so great and the last scene, but the, um, among other things, but she says, uh, you know, I take, I have a, a player, a, a, a player for every season. And, um, but at the very end, she says, um, I make, they make, I make them feel confident and they make me feel safe and pretty. Yeah. Oh, that's you know? beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. And by the way, and the, the, what you shared about the relationships, well, like that's, that is key to the movie. Like the whole movie is these figures who don't have any social relation, learning that they share suffering together. And like that, and mm. it's almost like how to reintegrate into relationship. That's, that's these characters who are so outside the social body and learning that they have something in common, something shared. But what was the film, by the way, you mentioned with that line? A bull Durham. Bo, bo, oh, I, I don't bull, know. Like, like a cow and a bull. Like a bull. Okay, Bull Durham. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a baseball film. Kevin Costner, Susan Sarandon. Oh, nice. You should watch it. Oh, I love I that idea. Love. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's classic. I love that idea, Linda, of uh, the communal expression of grief like um, only fully actualizing that morning uh, com communally. And I think a lot of this film. I was reading like harkens back to the Orpheus myth um, and Orpheus, the first tragedy is losing Eurydice. And of course the restaurant he goes to in the city is named Eurydice. Um, and the double twist comes when he turns back, he was told by Hades not to look back because then Eurydice dies. So the double twist, uh. you know, is the pig dying in this, but the idea of Orpheus going through this struggle you have the ferryman, 
uh, you have the dog, you have Hades himself, who's so moved by Orpheus's music that he he gives Orpheus uh, Eurydice back with that precondition. But this idea of like a community coming together for Orpheus to deal with his grief, and maybe even the idea that he was never supposed to bring Eurydice out of Hades or hell. The idea was that he was supposed to come to terms with Eurydice being dead by looking back and actually seeing, you know, and, and when I hear like that I'm on fire thing with Bruce Springsteen and Amir is crying in the car and all that, I see like, and Darius is drinking whiskey or whatever the hell he's doing crying i see this like community of grief coming to terms finally they've looked back finally and seen this tragedy the double twist and they're experiencing it for the first time and i think that's only really possible like you were saying linda in a communal sort of setting individually you're rob and you you can't play the tape or you're amir and you talk to your dying mom from the closed door or your Darius and you just are a dick. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I was I was thinking that that idea of relationship might be is the twist that the reputation gets. Like are you your name or are you your face that that gets twisted into that idea of you are the relationships that you hold. And then the double twist of now you have relationships and that how to deal with your grief that that all gets t twisted together and that it's your relationships that help you to deal with your grief they yeah, sort of being and having is connect me connect very good that was a great call back there by the way very good so you, i like that being and having but yeah that's that's it we are uh, what we have in our relationships that's beautiful peter could you answer Sarah's question, because I know that you had talked about the double twist. Could you maybe just quick go over what both twists are again? Oh, yeah. And, and I know people had referred to it after you, but maybe go back to your initial um, putting that forward. Yeah. So, I mean, the way I read it, and it, I just find a really interesting article this morning that I'm going to read. A com some computer programmer has kind of attempted to, to prove uh, Levi Strauss's kind of notion of myth. So I can't, but it's going to, it's a technical article, but I'm looking forward to reading it. I should share it with anyone who wants to read it, uh, uh, email me. Um, for me, so the first twist or the first attempt to, uh, to reconcile the problem for Levi Strauss is um, there's, a, there's some sort of like, uh, uh, there's an attempt to overcome the contradiction. Um, and so for me, that is the kind of the image of, uh, Nicholas Cage then entering the world, going in, in search of the pig, um, potentially retribution and justice and all of that. Um, but then the double twist, see the double twist is almost, the way I understand it is the double twist is when um, a character, whenever the contradiction is woven in. So in, in a way you can say the pig is the, is the trauma of the loss externalized. And you're trying to kind of reconcile that. And then the trauma is internalized. It becomes part of the character. So um, whenever, if you read this Levi Strauss article, A Structure of Myth, you, th there's, four point, there's four parts to the, this canonical formula. So the first is um, uh, th there's two positions, which are two attempts to reconcile a problem. So this is maybe for me the loss of, say, the other two different characters who, who try to reconcile this in different ways ex externally, then the failed attempt, and then the internalization of the contradiction. So the whole thing for Levi Strauss is contradiction is never overcome. It is woven in. You always try to overcome the contradiction, get rid of it in some way, and then you have to realize that it's part of you. But I don't know if that's any, Justin, does that clarify it at all? Do you want to jump in and add something to that? No, I, I think just restating that as Sarah had asked about that to make sure that we understood where we were going with that. And I, I think maybe if I'm understanding you correct, by the, at the beginning, if he starts in a position of, if, you know, um, give, you said giving up desire, but also in some ways, almost like intense desire of living a, away from his old, like, completely lacking his uh, his object. Yeah. Um, and then where the end, the desire becomes sort of its own answer where living in that, living in that place of lack kind of is the the answer to, to the question of desire in the first place, I think is 
yeah it's like, awesome. it's, yeah it's like the trauma is externalized at the beginning it's it's he hasn't been able to subjectivize it he hasn't been able to integrate it into himself and it's outside of him and for me symbolically and i could be wrong about this so i'm just firing out thoughts but symbolically you know it's like he's given up everything he's given up his his chef his life he's kind of become that recluse in the countryside but he hasn't subjectivized his trauma it's it's externalized in the pig and then at the very end, he's internalized the trauma, he's subjectivized it, he's been able to embrace it. And it's precisely that embrace subjectively of the trauma that robs it of its sting. It doesn't disappear, but it's robbed of its sting. In fact, it becomes sweet. And that beautiful image, I think, Kev, you said it, of like the, um, that whatever it was that is, this, that is too bitter to taste, but over time eventually becomes sweet. That, that uh, he finally is able to subjectivize his trauma. Yeah, where at the beginning he had that losing his wife and then withdrawing from society was this profound loss of his identity and this profound lack where at the end he sort of, when he goes back into town and he kind of, as you see him over and over again, recognized for who he is, but in this new form, like this this sort of wounded king that he kind of, like the return of this uh, like God to to earth. Yeah. I, I, I just could... I can keep saying it. I just think this movie is just so profound and so amazing. But here, Justin, I was going to hand over to you anyway to finish up. I don't know if there's any comments you wanted to make or anything that was in the chat you want to reference, but I know we're coming to the end, so over to you. Yeah, um, I mean, maybe I'll say if anybody else who hasn't spoken or anything kind of has a last point to make, but I, I think I've said everything I have to say about this, which is that it's an amazing movie. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything else? I don't know, really what you just said about like the king coming back to earth like that's such a beautiful like I was looking for someone to talk about him as like the maker of the food movement like because he made the food like the way that the story project like tells it like he was like the author of a lot of what was happening and then he leaves and he comes back so that was nicely said yeah and Lee um, or Leah? Yeah, Leah. I have a, I have a Leah. how do you pronounce that? Leah? Leah. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a sm small critique of the film in that the, the portrayal of Robin as the artist, as the kind of the master or the expert. And even the last scene is showing the beautiful things he has in his kitchen, even though he lives in that cabin in the woods. And he's able to make amazing recipes because he's so highly skilled. And there's there's that little reference to Babette's feast of this master artist. And that also that idea that the artist is never poor, you know, because they have all these internal abilities. So the, just the exoticizing of the artist or portraying the artist as like the master of their domain, there's just there that that falls apart a little bit for me. Um, if you if you play it out socially, uh, yeah, something about the expert, yeah. Yeah. I that, think that, we, I, I want to critique that a little bit. Yeah. Um... I think it works for me only in the sense that, as I was saying, that defining the chef specifically as this lacking person, this person who's cannot exist without lack and that they make these meals only to give them away, and that that's part of their meaningful ritual, that, that that to me is a more interesting thing than as if being an artist is this this full, this fullness that he has possession of that normal people don't have, and he gets to go live off connected to nature in a way that that the people in Portland are, you know, separated from. I, th I think only understanding it through the lens that I mentioned avoids the trap that I was, frankly, when I started watching this movie, I was like, I'm, sh I'm shocked Pete would like this because it seems so invested, at least initially, in this idea that he's this, uh, that he is at one with the other of nature and that he kind of has this connection by living out in the woods that I thought Pete would be just, you know, vomiting while watching it. But then, <laughs> then as it kind of unpacked that, I thought that I thought it did a good job of not investing itself in that idea. If I understand, I, Leah, your critique correctly. Yeah. You like I like about it, like, the critique about the mountain as a volcano. Like even when you're trying to talk about like we can escape to nature, and he's like, you know, that's an active volcano. <laughs> so I like I love how like you know that that's like an idea that people are going to be thinking of is this like escape to nature, and then even that line is there to like not let you go there. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. He he isn't naive about nature in that sense. Um, personally, as I mean, I, I've been a cook most of my life. And it's so true that you are like fulfilling other people's desires 
or creating, you know, out of disparate fragmentary elements. But at the same time, you're sort of nullifying your own desire. Uh, while I'm cooking, I don't want to eat. <laughs> I'm cooking in a hot kitchen and I'm serving other people's desires, but it kind of allows me to repress um, my own desires in a sense. Like I get disgusted with food or I get disgusted with the act of consumption itself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. That, that was just interesting to me. Also, the idea of having melancholy, but not mourning. I related to i don't know if anyone else did because i'm not sure what i'm supposed to mourn if i have melancholy like i'm looking for that maybe i need a pig <laughs> i don't know if anyone else feels that leah i love your point though about the artist like what is it about the artist that makes people drawn to them like is it their mastery over their form or is it the sense that they have like a pure connection to the objea like i think that that's often like what people like need from the artists is the sense of like a lack of trauma and this like pure connection where I think this book, this movie is like unpacking that, but it is an interesting thing. Like there's some scenes where you could kind of question whether or not they're showing some mastery in him. Sarah, I'd be saying like, I know that when you go to concerts with people, maybe who don't make art themselves, a lot of times the comment they'll say is like, imagine being able to like feel directly experience your emotions like that person on stage singing that way and i don't know i i think i like understanding the value of art more as like almost a pathetic impossibility of existing in isolation because if you no matter what art you make it's a you can't exist on your own because it needs an audience even 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 an, if that's just an implied audience yeah, but you you can't sell art unless people have the fantasy that you have that connection. <laughs> like I've yeah. talked to lots of friends that like give away the secret to what they're doing and then it like loses all value to people. <laughs> it's like a it, it interesting like dilemma that artists are put into. Mm -hmm. They need a magician's code. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they use Rob to kind of bring that out with how like, people are treating food like it's a magical thing, like the waitress at uh, Fenway's who expla explains like, we have de deconstructed this so that we could make the ordinary extraordinary or something like that. And then he just grabs one of the scallops and pops it in his mouth. <laughs> or <laughs> after uh, like, and they look at him like, you're not approaching this with the correct sense of reverence. And then when him and Amir serve the meal and he just sits down and he just grabs his fork. I think he's even holding it with like the wrong, his knife with the wrong hand, according to like custom. And then he starts just eating and they look at him like, like, where's your sense of reverence? And that's as, as an artist, like this amazing food has just become ordinary to him. Like it's lost that magical quality or he's d divested himself of the magical quality of it. I think that's about as good of a statement of uh, what this movie is and what we're going to get that uh, to close on. So, yeah, I, maybe I'll...